The first of our panelists, I'm trying to condense what is a very detailed history. I noticed he started at the Lodge School. Sorry, Carmen Mary missed him. So from the Lodge School to McGill University in Canada, from an agricultural sales representative at DaCosta Mannings, whatever became of that, to the manager of Friendship Plantation, the co-owner and director and technical services of something and some place that I have a close affinity to a carib rehab because it's for the elderly and the disabled. I think I tick those two boxes. Um, <laughs> we may soon all get there. <laughs> but his work has been in agriculture and his heart is in it. His voice has been raised on more than one occasion on matters concerning agriculture. And he's promised that to go forward one must first start in the fields and go back. So the challenge for Mr. Patrick Bethel, a holder of the Barbados Service Star, is this. Let me ask a question as Colonel Brown did. How do we move this concept of agriculture in our minds for, from a uh, white plantation owner sitting on the patio drinking uh, some beverage to some black fellow in the field with a straw hat and a hoe and a fork, to this technological age where we are partners in an enterprise that's going to bring wealth to all of us because we seem to be sometimes stuck in a mindset that says agriculture is a long shirt, a long pants, boots, a fork and a hoe, and a lot of sweat. Oh, and monkeys and pray their last name. Mr. Patrick Bethel. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Honorable Minister, members of the panel, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the Association. Everybody hear me? Thank you. Um, some statements were made earlier that require answers, but I am not here to answer them tonight because they require a lot of details. I would just like to say to the engineers present, in engineering, I believe one on one always equals two. In farming, one on one can equal two, 22, or minus 22. It is a very inexact science. It is, and as regards the Barbados being a panacea, the Garden of Eden, it's obviously my brother is not practicing in agriculture because we are laden with challenges and we're very professional people in the Ministry of Agriculture who are working closely with us. But let us get into the subject matter. I am allotted 20 minutes and I, I, I hope not to digress, but I need to go back because Subject I was told was technology and agriculture, then I hear technology making agriculture work for Barbados. I thought I should take us back to the settlement of Barbados by the Indians, Amerindians, first, because they were a maritime people, but they did grow crops, uh, cassava and corn, and they used to use a stick. But then they came around and somebody had a great idea and they introduced some technology. Now, does anybody? I'm sure some of you will know what these are. Anybody know that there? Yeah. It's the basic hoe that was used with the original settlers of Barbados. They graduated from a stick. They take a conch shell, they shaped it, they put a, another stick st through here, and then you had a hoe. And this was what was used by the Indian population. These were actually found on my farm in Friendship, which is about five miles from the sea. So our original farmers did stretch out away. So the Indians disappeared, and then the white man arrived. And he brought big progress now. Because then I'm sure you all know what this is. Because <laughs> this was the next big change. And believe it or not, th these are very specialized bits of equipment. Um, a hoe comes in three different sizes, a 1P, a 2P, and a 3P hoe, for those who don't know. But this made big progress, and then with the forks also with it. So we progress an hour, 
Our agriculture then was very, what we call the 10 acre man, the five acre man. It was indigo, cotton, and uh, a bit of tobacco. Tobacco went to the Carolinas and the cotton, we couldn't compete. So then sugar was brought in. And with sugar, we had then a rapid expansion and, uh, of the farming uh, sizes. So then you had to cultivate the land. So we then brought in plows. These were animal driven, oxen driven primarily. They were originally wooden with a steel share in front. And between eight, about, uh, 12 to 16 oxen pulling this plow. We then went from the wooden plow to the metal plow. One wheel in front and a man walking behind. Are we really making progress now? We're moving now. This went on for a few, good few hundred, maybe a year, hundred years or so. Then we had the steam power tractors and traction engines that came in. And they were doing, pulling plows behind them and providing power for the farm. Then we went to the diesel and the gasoline power tractors. And those of you who are more mature in this room would remember the old wheel tractors when they were going to plow, they took off the rubber wheels, they put these big iron wheels on the back, and they pulled the plow. Worked well when the soil was dry. When it was wet, it was a horror show because you had to dig off this mud that was on the wheels. Then we went to the three-point linkage and the hydraulics on the tractors where the implements are now held behind. So this is all we know graduating huh, in this technology business. But at the time, the, the crops were, sugarcane was the dominant crop. And we were then growing some crops in rotation, primarily to feed our population. Such things as yams, sweet potatoes, edos, corn, um, runcible or increased peas, uh, pigeon peas, and field tomatoes. While this was taking place, our cane breeding was also going through a tremendous change. And the West Indies Cane Breeding Station is a world leader. It is the second, I think it's the second oldest game breeding station in the world. Ian, is the second or the first? Second? And it is a world leader in breeding cane. It, it produces a new cane for all sugar industries throughout the world. It is financed by sugar industries throughout the world. Every year, some 20,000 seedlings are selected. They go across at groves to the variety testing station. They're planted and they're evaluated. It takes approximately 13 years from the time you select a seedling to the time you have a commercial variety. This is an ongoing exercise. And of that original 20,000 varieties, you may get one or two that may be suited. And we currently have about 17 commercial varieties of cane available in Barbados. This is an ongoing program, and it's very uh, progressive. The minister raised an issue a few weeks ago with one of the breeders. As we are going through climate change, we're experiencing more drought. What are we doing about it? Already, and this was before this happened, we, the breeding program is selecting genes to enhance the cane to withstand drought. But this will take time to work through. But we are working on it with technology. Then in the 70s, we had another revolution in, in Barbados agriculture, where an Englishman by the name of Brian, Dr. Brian Evis introduced the precision planters into Bar Barbados. The precision planters as well as modern fertilizer and spraying equipment, allowed us now to move from the, the original agriculture to pure stands of uh, vegetables, onions, carrots, uh, cabbage, sweet potatoes. Simultaneously with that going forward, we had the, um, the older irrigation uh, facilities, but we were introducing new, uh, better, efficient sprinklers, more efficient overhead irrigation as well as drip irrigation was also introduced and drip fertigation, again to, to maximize the use of our resources. Then you saw the introduction of shade houses. They're not green houses, they're shade to protect the crops from the, the driving torrential rains. But they introduced a whole slew of challenges because you have a, a, a temperature factor in there which is very challenging to cool. The, the biggest producer on the island, he actually shuts down his, 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 his uh, shade houses during the hot summer months. Um, and also for disease control. Then you would have heard hydroponics, aquaponics, vertical farming, and controlled environments. So all these is technology working in agriculture, and the farmers have embraced it and are taking it with them and are growing with it. The poultry industry, I've, I've dealt with on crops there, the poultry industry, again, highly technical from the hatch and egg selection right through the hatching, the growing, to the processing of, of the chicken meat. 
The, the dairy and pig industry, very similar. High technology, AI in, uh, in, in the breeding sows and in the dairy farms. Yeah, highly automated uh, milk in parlors. And likewise, the pig process. So all of this is technology. But the sugar industry is not to be left out. The, your, your president said that he, um, he didn't know what factory he'd go into and see modern equipment. But um, maybe when the crop gets going, another story. Um, <laughs> when the crop gets going, uh, we could take him on a tour of Portville factory. And I'm sure you would open your eyes to some of the technology that's currently being in use and is being introduced. But let's look at the sugar industry when we started. The original mills were animal powered mills. They would have like four cows tethered with shafts that rotated all day long, and you had vertical mills, the cane was fed into it, the juice flowed downhill. Then the Dutch came in, I think the Dutch and the Portuguese, and we had wind powered horizontal mills. This again was now, some people say free, but the wind power is very unreliable. And you you know, you see it today with, with PV systems, uh, not, not PV, sorry, with uh, wind power, it's unstable. In fact, there's a story that one, one, one windmill in a particular farm, um, a duck went in the heap of canes, laid it eggs, and hatched out young ducks before the, fact, the, the mill started turning again. Um, I don't know how long a duck takes, but I think it's about three weeks. But that, that's actual fact. So we then went to the steam plower mills, the, 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 what we regard today as the sugar factory, the modern sugar factory. But, and again, when we started that, you had your windmills and your crushing, the juice flowed primarily by gravity to originally a series of large um, teaches where each, each teach, the, the temperature underneath it, the heat it got hotter. The juice was ladled. It wasn't even flowing in a pipe. They had, it was, the term was called, it was ruining the juice, where you had these big labels, ladles, and the juice was scooped from one pH into another one. Eventually, it got to the point where it became then syrup, and the syrup then became something called massaquit. Massaquit being a mixture of molasses and sugar crystals. But what do you do with this product? It's a gooey stuff. What do you do with it? It was then put into uh, sugar molds, and the molasses were allowed to drain out and your sugar was then left uh, for shipment. But then we introduced the vacuum pans, and the vacuum pans allowed you to boil your, your, your juice now at a much lower uh, uh, vacuum, at much lower temperatures, and also save considerable on energy uh, use. And you also had better con control. But you still were faced with how do you separate the sugar from the molasses. And that's the way we introduced the centrifugals. Centrifugals being a, a spinning big tub with a, a spinning wheel inside of it, a screen, the sugar molasses mixture goes in the center, it's spun out, the molasses comes out, and the sugar is left. And the first centrifugals, again, some of the mature members of our, our audience, you know, I don't know, use this word old. Um, <laughs> you remember going to factory and seeing these great big belts, highly dangerous, whipping around, and you know, every now and again, they may slip off and knock off somebody's head. We then went from the belt power centrifugals to the turbine power, uh, water turbines, and then currently the electrical powered, uh, which are totally computer controlled now. Um, so it's all a thing. So, and also the factory is guided by a state of the art uh, lab, which does the sampling with sugar, sampling the juice, and the quality, everything is, is ongoing. So I, I want to, I, I had to take you back to bring you forward. Hope you don't mind that, Dennis. No, that's good. Um, and I, I submit to you that um, technology has worked, and, has, and agriculture has worked for Barbados, and it can still make it work. And if you want to see three examples of it, visual, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, the Bridgetown Port, Haggett's Plantation, the Soil Conservation, all came out of the sugar industry funds. The windfall issue with the right on our bar, where $40 million was taken out of the sugar industry and put into the consolidated fund. Uh, the Prime Minister Tom Adams also took his hands and took some millions out of the, again, out of the farmer's pot and put in the consolidated. So agriculture with technology has made a major contribution. But I agree with your, your chairman, your, your president. We have slipped and we are slipping backwards and we have to arrest that slide to go forward. What is happening? Um, with technology, 
we have had in many areas increased production. But bear in mind that all agriculture is subject to weather and sugarcane in particular is the most vulnerable to weather. In 2016 growing season, we had excellent rainfall, well distributed. You know, visualize a man said, now you give him a plate of food, big plate of food, and he eats it, belly full, and then don't give him any food for three weeks. He has a problem. But give him a little bit of food every day, and he can do well. Same thing with sugarcane. It's not only last year, now we had the opposite. We had a terrible year for growing. You get a two inch rainfall, three, four weeks, nothing happened, then a four inch rainfall. When we hit October, November with the planting season, no rainfall. And today's paper highlights what we are facing. So irrigation water is available but in limited quantities. So weather plays an important part of our agriculture production. But when we increase production, we also then come into another force called market forces. And market forces control by I use the word, the people who really control the economy of Barbados since our settlement. And some people may take offense at what I'm about to say. I regard a government and ministers, with all due respect to you, sir, are birds of passage. They come and go. That's our nature. But there's one constant in all this exercise, and it's the merchant class in Bridgetown and those who import. And I've experienced it personally. I've seen it. I'm going to give you three examples. When we brought in onions, went into onion production, led by the De Corsi Jeffers and the late Dr. Chandler, our production peaked to 240 acres. But to achieve this, we had to have protection. And thanks to Mr. Branford Tate, who was then the Minister of Trade, imposed licensing, which restricted the importation of onions into Barbados. The industry grew with technology, with research, to the point where we were almost self-sufficient. We figured we would run about two months of the year short. But boy, did we mash some corns. I'll never forget one day I went down to buy some hams. And the gentleman that owned the ham place, not the ham factory, the place that sold it, looked at me and said, boy, Patrick, the other man at the top said from next, this year we get in the license to import onions again. I said, thank you very much, forearmed, forewarned is forearmed. I went home, pulled up my irrigation pipes. I've never put them back in the field again. I didn't have water to compete, growing them out of crop. So we were competing with heavily subsidized product from Canada and from um, the Dutch. The result was that the industry has shrunk from 240,000 acres to 25, 30 acres. And there are two, there are, at the table, there are two former on, uh, onion producers. And I'm not referring to Dennis Johnson or the minister. There are two of us that were former onion producers. We were told in no uncertain terms, one gentleman told me, boy, I don't need to buy local onions. I can make my money on the imported onions and you can do what you want with yours. When that, uh, mark, that, that protection was removed, the industry basically collapsed. The onions that are produced now are only produced in a very narrow window when you cannot buy onions on the overseas market. That's the end of their storage period and the local supermarkets and some of the import will not, cannot buy from other sources so they're forced to turn to the local farmer. Peanuts, I'm not speaking of peanuts, Morrison, peanuts that we eat. Um, and he was a wonderful minister of agriculture, with all due respect, I, I, I give my full credit, credence to him. We did research in, uh, in peanuts. We actually, there was one farm that was to, in St. John, totally mechanized, from planting to fertilizing, to, to taking them out the ground, turning them over, drying them, harvesting them. But again, we mashed corns. And certain gentlemen went, crocodile tears, we can't sell the peanuts, you've got a market block, what are you gonna do? Market was open. You only see peanuts growing out in a short, it's few areas, um, you see a half acre or acre grown. Um, and Again, how could we compete with Georgia, where the peanuts are growing, and full support with, with the government uh, in terms of technology and resources? Sugar. Topical subject at the moment. As I speak to you, Bar's market for sugar is about 4,000 tons. The future of our sugar is direct consumption of sugar. That is a high quality sugar that is being marketed in England, is marketed in the US. 
and market in a year. Prices are around $1,000 US a ton versus $350 US for the bulk sugar. But as I speak to you, the market for sugar of 4,000 tons, only 2,000 tons is local sugar. We're still importing about 2,000 tons of sugar from two regional sources. And the government and the Minister of, let me get it right, the Minister of Finance, I think it is, I hope she doesn't quarrel with me, under the Chagramas Agreement, has the authority to protect local production of brown sugar, both in quantity and in and, and quota and in tariffs. I can't say why we're still importing sugar, but I thought we should protect our local market to develop it because you, you have government putting a lot of resources and the farmers into the sugar industry. So we have a situation where the farmers are responding. The technology is there. We've, and the unfortunate part is, and, and I, I'm not blaming the minister, don't get me wrong. Government ministries don't seem to, to gel together. You have the Ministry of Agriculture working with the farmers to increase production. You have, I don't know what it's called now, but it used to be the Ministry of Industry and Commerce working to import the same production that the farmers are producing. And the Ministry of Tourism said, but we have to import what the tourists want to eat. But we're the farmers in the middle like idiots out there growing the prop and doing and responding. That is the challenge that we find extremely frustrating. It is very, very uh, demoralizing to go through this exercise. You see it in the paper every now and again. A farmer produces a wonderful crop of cabbage or whatnot. Suddenly he can't sell it. A whole lot of imported cabbage into Barbados. But I'm not finished. I brought another crop for you. <laughs> Somebody asked me why I bring me by me. I say bring food. <laughs> I don't know how long this meeting going to be, so I bring food. <laughs> The poultry industry, one of the most successful high-tech industries in Barbados. In the, in the yard fold. In the yard <laughs> But here it is now. Pressure is being put on the government to free up the market, to let chicken come in, Barbados, as it crossed the board. As it now stands, the BADMC is supposed to be sole importer of poultry meat. I think it's 60,000 kilograms a year, poultry wings and 40,000 pounds of turkey wings, okay? But look what we got here. I brought it frozen. Classic chicken breast strips with rib meat, seasoned and sliced fully cooked, bought from a supermarket in Christchurch. This is what we're up against. These are being eased in the country and the displaced local production. And this happens throughout and you know, the Ministry of Agriculture, the Minister of Agriculture is doing his best to, to promote local production. And then you have the situation taking place. So how do we go forward? Okay, some people say, well, what about the export market? We've looked at it. We used to export yams to the US market going back in the 80s and, and, and the early 90s. And the crop lives my yam. The first year we got through pretty good. But the second year we got a directive from the US Department of Agriculture. You have to set up a fumigation chamber to fumigate yams. Okay. But it has to be operated and manned by USDA personnel. And you have to pay for them. Project finish. We tried exporting sweet potatoes, but we were in conflict with sweet potatoes from the Carolinas. Again, we had a, we, we had a, a we then looked at exporting, we tried exporting uh, for pause, and I'm going even as much as 40 years ago, into the US. We did some into it, it here. Again, we didn't realize we were competing with Hawaii, production in Hawaii. So again, we got the job. Let's take sugar. After the National Rifle Association and the Dairy Farmers Association in the US, the sugar lobby is the most powerful lobby. It is so powerful that and it's very few families are actually involved in it but it's so powerful that the american sugar farmer gets a guaranteed price of, i think it's 21 us cents a pound the world price is down in single digits right now but he gets 21 cents a pound shortly before president obama vacated office 
he signed another five-year contract for the sugar farmers of America. So they knew we could invest in equipment. We knew what's going to happen for the next five years. We had a level playing field, and we knew where we were going. And so there was the sugar. Now, I haven't dealt, and will not deal with this discussion on pre deal larceny. That is a discussion by itself. Because that might get me in trouble. I, 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 in my other capacity, I, I go into, uh, um, I never felt comfortable in Glendary, but I felt very comfortable at Dodds. It was a lot safer. The problem is, I like to sleep with my windows open. I can't get it done at Dodds, and I might put myself in trouble with the pre deal arson. So I backed off, and I was still croaking. So, minister, gentlemen, ladies um, involved, I think agriculture we, we, with technology has, has made a major contribution. The farmers have embraced it, they continue to embrace it, but we are not alone. And, and Sir President, the Barbadian environment for agriculture is, is a very challenging one. Bear in mind there are 12 months growing of weeds and 12 months of insects. In North America, you have winter. So you have a spring and summer and a little bit of fall and that's it. And then a new vindicator comes in. So we, I think we've done a great job. We have a lot more to do. And, 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 and I'm pleased to say that the current level of communication and cooperation with the Ministry of Agriculture and the farming community is so much, and I'm not saying this to impress you, you know, <laughs> is so much uh, better and so much um, more you know, communicating, which, which is what we need to do. So with that in conclusion, I thank you. And I feel honored as a, as a, as a, a boy from the country and uh, to come down this hallowed hall I've re heard so much about and be able to be privileged to talk to you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Bethel, I, I want to take a couple minutes to say thank you for a very intriguing presentation. I'm glad you went back. <laughs>